right out of heaven sweep to us. This altar is full of miracles right now. This baptism was full of miracles. There's only one way to get your sins gone, and that's in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's power in his name. The Bible said, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Let's do the whole place today. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Thank you for this wave of glory that has just swept through here. Let disease be gone. Let illness be gone. Let sin be broken. Let the darkness be broken. Let the chains break from the souls, God pray. Lord, with great and mighty things, we pray that we have not yet known. Call upon me and I will answer thee and give, show thee great and mighty things. Lord, we pray you'll manifest your power in ways heretofore we have never witnessed. Let it happen in this church. Let your power manifest in our homes, in our families, in our communities, in our schools, in the workplace. Let the power of God manifest in America, in this nation, in the name of Jesus. I think right now is a good time to praise the Lord again. Thank you, Lord. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one mind and one accord. I looked across this front of worshipers. I looked out here at the worshipers. I saw a wave of praise just go up and down and all around and through us. Healings, deliverances, victories, Lord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues like as of fire set upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I pray that Pentecostal experience will hit this world again. If you have that experience, why don't you just pray in your prayer language right now with your hands lifted. Come on, that's it. Give him that prayer language. The highest name, not only in this world, but in the world to come. We come in the name of the resurrected Jesus. Whose we are and whom we serve, that at the name of Jesus, everything shall bow. Whatever you're facing has to bow. It has to bow, say it, it has to bow. Sickness has to bow disease has to bow fear has to bow habits habits have to bow afflictions have to bow bondages have to bow right now not tomorrow not tonight right now somebody say right now everything in my life that is not of God has to bow right now now give a praise in the name of Jesus. Oh yes. Everything has to bow now. All nations are bowing eventually. They're coming. They're coming down to the knee. They're gonna put the knee in before Jesus. Today, Lord, we declare a prayer shield around us. Cover your home with a prayer shield. Cover your home with the blood of the Lamb. Oh Lord, put a prayer shield around us and our families, upon this region, upon this nation. I pray these prayers will form hedges of protection around us and hide us from the scourge of the enemy and familiar spirits and any spiritual darkness. Lord, I pray blocking, may it block all progress of wickedness in this land. We pray the power of your presence is here today. Transform our lives to walk pleasingly before you, that we may walk in holiness and righteousness. Transform our communities and this region by your presence. May the glory of the Lord transform this land and the nations of the world. In the name of Jesus, we give a great praise again. Would you praise him?
we pray the mighty warring angels of heaven would come into this region. The Bible says God makes his angels the spirit and his ministers a flame of fire. I pray those strong warring angels come across this land fighting for God's people, breaking spirits of darkness, breaking the powers of the enemy trying to take a nation down in another direction. Lord, we break through these barriers of darkness by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, we pray for America to experience a move of God heretofore never seen. We pray, Lord, this nation will be shaken by the hand of God. We pray this state will be shaken by the hand of God. We pray this region will be shaken to the powers of God. Let this church experience a shaking in the Holy Ghost. There's such a deep intercession in this place. This is a life-changing moment. And if you will let this presence get into your heart, those habits and those afflictions and those addictions are being snapped now. Broken now. For our last prayer today, I ask you to listen carefully. I have been bothered in my spirit that the enemy would like to close this nation down again with another disease. I'm not predicting that. I'm not a fatalist. I'm not trying to uh, stir up defeatism, but I think we need to jump ahead of the devil. It shall not be in the name of Jesus say it shall not be by the blood of the lamb no disease on the land off go leave don't we take authority over disease and plagues thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day nor those pestilences that creep through the land by night or the destruction that comes at noon. A thousand shall fall at thy hand and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. I want you to say that with me. It shall not come nigh thee. Point to somebody and say, it shall not come nigh thee. Say, I don't want it. I will not receive it. I'm covered by the blood of the lamb. I'm covered by Psalms 91. I am covered by Psalms 91. Cover your home right now. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings thou shalt trust. Only you shall behold it with thine eyes and see the reward of the wicked. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. His face is against those who do wickedly. Wicked people are in trouble. They're in big trouble. Now here's what you do. You just keep walking with God. If you messed up a little bit this week, you just keep walking. You get up, you brush yourself off, and you get back to the house of God, and you get your hands up, and you say, God, forgive me. God, heal me. God, you straighten me out. God, I need you to straighten me out because I want to walk right in Jesus' name. Because you have made the Lord your habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, nor any plague come nigh thy dwelling. I give you these words with a great shout of praise today. God's a great God in this house today. Give him a praise. Give him a praise.
Oh, give him a praise. Hallelujah. Kids blessed, dismissed. Turn to someone and greet a few people. Take a little time to say hello. Greet them in the manner in which you are comfortable. Kids blessed, you may go. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Remember, we give offerings in three ways. We give in the boxes, in the foyer, in the halls. We give by envelope. You can mail in. And if you're really technical savvy, you can give online. All right, I think there are fireworks tonight, and at some time you'll see it here. You may seat yourselves for announcements. Morning, Christ Tab. My name is Jonathan, and I'm just going to take a couple minutes to tell you about some exciting things that are happening here at Christ Tab. If this is your first time at Christ Tab, we are so excited that you are here. Please stop by the Connection Center and fill out a connection card. We can answer any questions you may have, and you get a free gift. Tonight, starting at 6 p.m., we are having a family fun night. There will be a food truck and inflatables for the kids, followed by the best fireworks show that Herrick has ever seen. You don't want to miss it. Our annual backpack giveaway is August 7th at 10 a.m. This is a great event hosted by Axe Ministries that gives away backpacks, shoes, lunch boxes, and all kinds of school supplies. Tomorrow from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. there will be a packing party in the Eva Hunt. Please contact Michelle Timpany if you are able to help. Have you heard about Celebrate Recovery? This incredible ministry meets here every Thursday night and is here to help anyone recovering from the past hurts, habits, and hang-ups. There's a meal at 5.30, followed by a large group at 6.30, and then they break out into small groups. For more information, please see the CR table in the foyer. If you'd like to give in the offering, there are black boxes in the walls for cash and checks. If you'd like to give online, you can always text the amount to 84321 and make sure you click the link to follow the steps. To stay up to date on Christ Tab events, make sure you give us a like on our Facebook page at Christ Tab Church and follow us on Instagram at Your Christ Tab. Thank you for spending your Sunday here at Christ Tab, whether online or joining us in person. I hope you enjoy the rest of the service and welcome home. Thank you, Jesus. We give you glory. I'm thankful that we know that all things work together to them that love God to them who are called according to His purpose. Aren't you thankful today? No matter what you're going through, all things are gonna work together for your good. Hallelujah. This heavy load was never mine to bear, so I cast my cares upon you, Lord. This weary road I've traveled for so long Would you take my hand and lead me on? You are working all things for my good You are working all things for my good When I cannot see it God, I still believe in you are working on things for my good.
lift up our hands and believe that in faith. God, you're working all things. Even when I can't see it, even when I don't feel it. My faith, how many today have got a faith that goes beyond feelings? Because I know that I know that I know there's a God named Jesus rose on the third day filled me with the spirit he's coming back so when I don't feel it I go past my emotions and I go to his character I go to his word which never lies never disputes itself come on let's lift up our hands right now let's just get encouraged in God sometimes we got to encourage ourselves. David encouraged himself in the Lord. So Lord, I pray encourage every person, Lord, that's here today, every person that made the effort to be here. God, we pray your spirit, God, would have power and authority in this room right now over every lie of the enemy. And we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Everybody clap your hands. Let's thank God today. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, as always. And today I wanna to talk about where hope comes from. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, where does hope come from? And I want us to go to Romans chapter five, one of my favorite passages of scripture that I think shows us where hope comes from and it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that, I want you to pay attention to this, we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And the question uh, so many people are asking is where's the hope? Where's the hope of getting past Corona? Where's the hope of uh, this world situation that seems to every day be getting worse and getting out of control. Where's the hope for our communities? With so many people lost, so many people bound in addiction. Where's the hope for the future? If, if it's this bad with this generation, what's it gonna be like in the next generation? And maybe we put it on a, a personal level and you're here today and you have a, a death sentence from a doctor. Where's the hope? You have a uh, insurmountable financial debt or a, a, a money situation, where's the hope? That's the question that deep down inside all of us ask, I would say daily. And that is the desire deep within our heart is for hope, to know that tomorrow is gonna be better, to know that there's a way out of this, to know that what I'm experiencing right now is not the final word, is not the end. And the problem is that we often look to all the wrong places for hope. We look to people for hope. We look to politicians for hope. We look to money for hope. We look to all of the things that bring us right back to the same spot that maybe they alleviate despair for a little bit, but eventually the hangover comes. Eventually the money runs out. Eventually, the relationship can't do what it promised. And by the way, I don't care how good your marriage is, the, the relationship's not where the hope's at. Where is the hope? And so as Christians, oftentimes we, we can look for the wrong places for hope. We're not immune to this. I've heard people place all their hope into God answering a particular prayer. And when God doesn't answer the prayer the way they expected him to answer it, they lose hope. They lose hope in the church. They lose hope in God. And God doesn't want us to pin the answer to our prayers for hope. He doesn't want us to pin, 
pin our hope upon a person. Uh, uh, your hope can't even be in this church. Your hope can't be in me. And in Romans chapter 5, Paul gives us a roadmap for how we get our hope back. And the first place that hope comes from is faith. Everybody say faith. faith. And faith is this. It is believing in the firmness of God's character and his promises. And Paul says, therefore, we have been justified by what? By faith. And then he says that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through him we have also obtained by faith into this grace which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope, everybody say the hope, of the glory of God. And so there's a progression. First of all, we've been justified by faith. What that means is that I am no longer God's enemy. Through my faith in Jesus Christ. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. And what we saw today is a beautiful picture of that. And that is our past is just that, it's our past. And these waters of baptism that was depicted. And so we have, through our faith, we've been reconciled with God from our past and we have peace with our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, through him we've obtained access by faith into this grace. And you know what that is? That's having a present personal relationship with God. And, and here's the beautiful thing about Jesus is that Jesus isn't looking for religion. And Jesus goes beyond religion and he goes to relationship. He's not only forgiven us of our past, but he says, I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you right here and right now. How, how many is glad today that we're not just celebrating the fact that God has forgiven us of our past, but we are here today because we have accessed through grace into the throne room of Jesus Christ and that we can feel him and know him personally. But it doesn't stop there. We're gonna see a progression of hope. My, my past is taken care of. I have hope because I'm, I'm walking with Jesus I'm not just some in religious charade where we do certain things to convince ourselves that we're spiritual, but we, we are walking, we have access by grace. And then he says this, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And so we've been justified, our past is taken care of, we have access by grace, our present is we're walking with God. And then our hope is that we are going to see the glory of God. And that is the promise of heaven. When God will bring his kingdom on this earth and heaven and earth will become one and he will restore Eden to the whole earth and we will see the glory of God. Come on, how many today has your hope in heaven? Has your hope not in this present world, but in the world to come when Jesus, does anybody believe Jesus is gonna come back? Come on, we, we need to talk about heaven. We need to sing about heaven. We need to rejoice in heaven. We need to remind one another in heaven. There ain't no grave gonna hold this body down when the trumpet sounds. We shall be with him. Come on. My hope isn't in my favorite baseball team because they might trade everybody in one day. <laughs> my hope's in heaven. My hope's not in this economic system. It's not whether inflation will continue to go up or down. My hope is in Jesus Christ today. Can anybody testify with me? First Thessalonians chapter four, Paul says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no what? Hope. hope. I wanna tell you, there's nothing sadder than going to a funeral with somebody that doesn't know Jesus. But some of the best times I've had have been at funerals of people who know God. Why, because we got hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul continues kind of in this line of thought. He says, if in this life we only have hope, 
in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. What, what he's saying is this. If Jesus didn't rise again from the dead, if it just stops at his death, we are of all men most miserable. But how many knows that's not the end of the story? And he goes on to point out that he rose bodily from that grave. And that's where our hope comes from, is the hope of glory. And our, our hope today isn't just in the story of Jesus being crucified, but our hope is he rose from that grave and he told his disciples in like manner as I'm about to take off out of here, I'm gonna come back. And we gotta live in that hope. We gotta get out of worldly thinking. We gotta get out of worldly thinking that says my hope is hinged on that job. My hope is hinged on that relationship, my hope is hinged on what the economy does. No, 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 my hope is hinged on Jesus. The song said it well, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. Man, they knew how to write songs back then, didn't they? I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground, is sinking sand. Is anybody standing on that solid rock today? That's Jesus. Yeah. Now, I'm about to throw you a curveball as Paul throws us a curveball and, and probably lose about half of you. The second place that Paul says hope comes from is suffering. Praise God. Amen. We have to realize that suffering is a part of our spiritual journey. And Paul says, not only so, but we have also glory. We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces a line of benefits. And we're going to walk through those today. And it's not that we rejoice because we're suffering, right? Like, like we, we're not just lining up here today, somebody punch me in the face, please. Somebody please pull my a tooth without anesthetic. That's not the point of suffering. We rejoice because we know that our suffering isn't wasted. We rejoice because we trust God that if he let me walk through this, he's not gonna let this pain and disappointment be wasted because God doesn't waste anything. And so suffering can bring a number of responses. Some people, when they suffer, they get bitter and they think they've been given a bad deal. Some people think that God owes them for what they've gone through. I hate to disappoint you with this, but I've seen some people suffer and it get worse. Just because you go through something, God doesn't say, okay, you've, you've finished your quota. And, and there's this really mesmerizing text in, in John and Jesus is walking with Peter and John and he's about to, to ascend into heaven and he, he turns to Peter and basically tells him, you're gonna be crucified. And Peter, being Peter, has to say something back. And he points at John and says, what about him? And Jesus said, don't worry about him. If I want him to live until I come back, that'll be his, his journey. And the point of that text is this, is that we all have our individual journey, and I don't understand why some people suffer more than others. But here's what we have to do. We have to trust God that he's doing something in the suffering. And some people think they, they suffer because God's paying them back for what they did in the past, and that's not biblical either. There's just some things that happen in life that we will never figure out. But we rejoice because we know the trouble we're going through, God isn't delighting in the trouble that we're going through. He's delighting in what he knows it's gonna produce in us. And Christians, we see the end of the road and we hold on to faith that the suffering is doing something not to me, but in me. And if you're here today and you're hurting, 
you got to realize that God is doing something not to you, but like Job, he's doing something in you. He's producing fruit in your life. In 1 Peter 4, uh, chapter 4, Peter says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. And what he's trying to tell us is this. Anybody that preaches a gospel that you give your life to Jesus and you don't suffer anymore, you need to immediately just turn that off. Because when you give your life to Jesus, he's going to allow some things to happen because he sees what can happen in you beyond what happens to you. And so we rejoice because we are worthy to suffer with Jesus and that we know when his glory is revealed, it's going to be worth it all. It's going to be worth every trial. It's going to be worth every pain, every bit of suffering. Is going to pale to the glory of Jesus. So hope first comes from suffering, and then he goes through a line of processes. He says, suffering leads to perseverance. You know, Anybody watching the Olympics right now? I don't think there's too many people according to the ratings, but. Just let me tell the illustration. <laughs> two minutes, no, no politics for two minutes, please. Those people got there. They got there by sitting on their couch, watching TV and eating potato chips. It's funny, we, we were watching the other night and uh, they were doing the hurdles and I said, you know, I think I can do most of this stuff, but I don't think I could do that. I was joking. I can't do any of it. No, they didn't get there by eating potato chips. They got there through suffering. Getting up at, you know, God only knows when. Spending all day not eating what they want. Hardly ever. And per perseverance is this. It's a single-minded focus. Those athletes have had this date on their calendar for four years. And every day, every hour leading up to this moment has been planned and focused. And when everybody else goes to McDonald's, they don't go to McDonald's. Why? I got a date in three years. And, and I'm going for that gold. I'm going for that prize. And I want to tell you, we've got to have perseverance. We've got to have single-minded focus. We can't get distracted by the things of the world right now. You know why? Because we have a date with destiny. We have a prize that is waiting for us in heaven. And so I've got to put, come on, somebody preach with me today. We've got to push aside the things of the world because i got something greater. Amen. Hebrews 12, I love this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and this picture he's giving is that of an arena, and there's a great cloud of witnesses, and those are the saints who went before us. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with what? Perseverance, the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes, what's the prize? On Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And, and he, then he gives us an example. He says, for the joy that was set before him, the prize that was set before him, what was his prize? Us. He endured the cross, scorning his shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We've, we've got to run this race with perseverance. When we want to quit, we got to keep running. When we want to stop praying, we got to keep praying. 
When people disappoint us, we, I'm not looking at them, I'm looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. When, when the world goes upside down, I'm not gonna get entangled in this world system. I'm not gonna get distracted. And I'm not gonna obsess about things that aren't heavenly. Why? Because I have one prize and I have a date with destiny and I've gotta be ready for that appointment. Suffering makes us focus on what's really important. We stop looking at the temporary things of this life and we start looking to the eternal. That's why we need to thank God for suffering. It's because it gets the lukewarmness out of my heart. It gets the distractions out of my mind. When God let us walk through that situation with George, it made me focus on what's really important made me focus on the things that really matter. And if, if you're suffering here today, it's not because God doesn't love you. It's because he wants to do greater things through you. And you just gotta trust him today. You need to look to him. Don't even look at the suffering. Don't even look at the pain. That pain is to drive you to him. And he is wanting you to persevere. He's wanting you to keep going. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, keep going. We're, how many knows that we're not there yet? We haven't seen the prize yet. We've only just tasted the appetizers of what God really has for us, and there's something greater. We have not attained it yet, but we're not gonna quit. How many days not about to quit? How many have decided in your heart? You're gonna keep running. Then he continues. So suffering leads to perseverance. Perseverance leads to character. And then character, this is where hope comes from. Character produces hope. You see, God is making you into a champion of faith by allowing you to go through these trials. And just as we don't randomly select some guy off the street to go run hurdles in Tokyo. God's got some champions in this room, but it's not gonna happen automatically. You've gotta go through suffering. You gotta lift those weights. You gotta run that race. And that's what produces character. That's what produces stick to -itiveness. That's a good word, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, to have character means this, it means to be tested. It means to be tested. It, it's that, that guy on the basketball court, everybody knows when there's three seconds left in the game, he's getting the ball. Why, because he's been tested. This isn't his first rodeo. And if you want hope, Hope doesn't come from quitting. Hope doesn't come from discouragement. Hope doesn't come from bitterness. But it comes when the storm comes. You don't run, you don't leave, but you stay by Jesus. You persevere, and that perseverance produces character. And out of that character comes hope. And you find out about somebody's character when adversity happens. You find out about character, not when everything's fine, but when there's bullets flying everywhere, when everything is going crazy and adversity comes, that's where you find the true seasoned soldiers. And it is impossible to have character or know someone's character until they've gone through a trial. I don't trust people until they have scars. I don't trust people who have never been through something and they came out of the other storm, other side of the storm. That's when I trust you. And I wanna tell you, some of you who are new and you're just starting to walk with the Lord, you need to find somebody in this church who is a seasoned saint of God because here's why that's important, because they have character. 
They've been here 30, 40 years. This isn't their first rodeo. They've persevered. They've gone through the storms. They have character. And when, you know what? When you hang out with those people, that's where hope comes from. They tell you, you can do it. You get right back up again. You come right back to this altar. You get up and you brush yourself off and you get up one more time. You pray one more time. You raise your hands one more time. Come on, does anybody here today have hope? Yeah, that's where hope comes from. Hope doesn't come from pansies. Hope doesn't come from limp-wristed people that when the bullets start flying, they're looking for their inhaler. Hope comes when you've got people around you They've seen the tricks of the enemy before. They've seen the devices of the enemy before. And they're with you and they don't move. They don't start running away, but they take on the shield of faith. They take on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation. And they say, we're gonna fight this together and you're gonna come out, come on. And here's what happens. When God lets us go through something and we persevere, it produces character. And here's what happens. It's not that storms stop coming. It's not that problems don't stop coming. God says, I can trust you for bigger problems now. And the bigger the problem, the bigger the promise. And we've always been a church, we've always been a people that doesn't run away from problems. And if you want the glory of God to be displayed in your life, and if you want God to do awesome things, you know what you're asking for? God, give me some problems. And we gotta have the spirit of David that doesn't run away from the problem, but runs to the problem because we know that we're anointed. We know that we have the armor of God. We know that we have the spirit of God in our life. And if God brought the problem in our life, it's for a reason and it's gonna produce the glory of God one way or another. Amen. Confidence. Those athletes. There was some guy there the other night jumping on a trampoline and doing flips and landing like in a precise spot. That wasn't his first time to do that. You know why he could stand up on that stage and do that with confidence? Not his first rodeo. And that's what God wants to do in, in, in our life is that when the storms come, we don't freak out. And when we're not you know, spinning around in, in despair, but we, uh, we lock our knees in, we, but put our feet solid ground and we say, you know what? This isn't the first time I've faced something. I have character because I've gone through the storm before and I'll go through other storms and I trust that God will see me through this one. God will see me through this storm. God will see me through today. Why? Because he was faithful yesterday. He was faithful 10 years ago. And that's where hope comes from. M. Scott Peck who is the author said this, it is within the process of meeting and solving problems that life has meaning. Problems are the cutting edge that distinguishes between success and failure. And it is only because of our problems that we grow mentally and spiritually. We grow through the pain of confronting and resolving problems. Fearing the pain involved, all of us tend to avoid problems. We procrastinate, we avoid them, and we pretend that they don't exist. We take drugs to assist us in ignoring them so that deadening ourselves to the pain, we forget the problems that cause the pain. This tendency to avoid problems, I want you to hear this, this tendency to avoid problems and the emotional suffering in them is the primary cause for all mental illness. So God today is wanting some people of character. And here's the point. There's people out there that need hope. And we can't give them hope if we haven't dealt with our stuff. If we haven't dealt with our pain. We haven't dealt with our problems. And so Jesus, when he comes, he doesn't deliver us from the suffering. But he says, no, no, I'm gonna let that suffering produce some things in you so that you can go out from this place and be a hope dealer. You can find somebody that's 
bound by drugs and you say, well, I used to be there. Let me tell you about what happened to me. You can go to somebody that's gone through the pain of divorce and say, I've been there. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. That's where hope comes from. And we have to embrace our scars today. How are we gonna know when Jesus comes back? We're gonna know him by his scars. And scars are a testimony of God's faithfulness. Scars are a testimony of the enemy tried this, but God. Come on, how many's got a but God story? You should be dead. You shouldn't be here. You should be bound by drugs. You should be in that place where you were. But God stepped in. And he gave us hope. Third place that hope comes from. So he walks through this process. Hope comes through our faith. Our past is forgiven. And we're given grace to have a relationship with God. And then ultimately we have the hope of the glory of God and his coming. And then he says that in, in between now and then, until he comes, he's gonna let us go through some stuff. He's gonna let us, the suffering's not from him, but he's gonna allow it because it's gonna produce some things in our life that allow us to give hope to other people. And then he finishes this thought in verse five. He says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The King James says it this way, this hope does not disappoint. How many have had some hope that disappointed? How many has had the hope that maybe this relationship will fix me? How many has had the hope that maybe this will be the job that makes me happy? Those are hopes that disappoint. But we have a hope that does not disappoint. And it comes from the Holy Spirit. You see, when God fills us with the Holy Spirit, you know what it is? And this is point three, hope comes from love. When God fills us with the Spirit, he fills us with his love. He fills us with the love of God. And this hope does not disappoint. It's impossible. I'm sorry, let me rephrase this. It's possible to experience the love of God and suffer at the same time. And that is countercultural. This whole thought he's giving is countercultural. Because the people on Instagram will tell you hope comes from having the right pool, the right house, with the right filter, right? I mean, anybody can look good with those filters they have now. Those filters they have on Instagram, like I can have a tan and hair. <laughs> and we're laughing, but, but, but people on social media are projecting this is where the hope is at. And Paul says, no, no, hope comes from suffering. Hope comes from experiencing the love of God in the middle of the problem. In the middle of the pain, we fill him with us and close to us because we're identifying with him. And that is where hope comes from. So the basis of our hope is that God's love is alive and present in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Because when you can walk through the storm of your life and feel the presence of God, that's something unexplainable. And that's a hope that the world can't give and the world can't take away. Amen. You can have a confidence. See, that's character. Where you say, crucify me, do whatever you want to do with me. But I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So 
so my hope today is this. Jesus loves me. Profound theological thought of the day. And there's been times in my life where I didn't see hope. Has anybody like lost hope in you? Has anybody lost hope in your situation? What gets me through those days aren't the thick theological books I have in my library, but it's three words. Jesus loves me. Jesus hasn't given up on me. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abide, I want you to see this. We've talked about faith. Faith, hope, that's what we're, the big picture of what we're talking about today. And love. But the greatest of these is love. You see, hope is not an end to itself. Hope is a part of love. And when life doesn't make sense, my great foundation is this, Jesus loves me with a perfect love. When I disappoint myself, when I don't even live up to my own values, when I don't see hope anywhere from an earthly source, I look my eyes to the author and the finisher of my faith who loves me. Now, we can amen, but I don't know about you. It's easier for me that, to believe that God loves you than he loves me. And sometimes we, we need to just have someone play devil's advocate. And when we're talking discouraged and we say, God doesn't love me, why would God allow this to happen? Why did God allow that to happen? You know what you need to do? Play a little mind trick and you have someone else come up to you and say, you know what, you're right. Jesus loves Troy, Jesus loves Tucker, Jesus loves Robin, Jesus loves Scott, but Jesus does not love you. And you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna get defensive and you're gonna realize how stupid your thinking sounds. Because if God loves all these people, if God died for all these people, if God forgives all these people, his grace is sufficient for me. Come on, somebody, stand to your feet. Let's stand to our feet right now. Let's thank him for the love where hope comes from. Our hope today is rooted in the love of God. That's what drove him to Calvary. Love raised him from that grave. And love is gonna bring him back. I wanna close today with this story that I thought of when I was preparing this. A few years ago, I went to the Picasso Museum in Barcelona. And it's, if you ever get to Barcelona, you gotta go there. And he just did incredible works of art. And the whole thing is mesmerizing. But there was this exhibit where later on in his life, he did these paintings that on the surface just look crazy. Like th there's no symmetry, there's no, it, just looking at it, you, you don't see the method to the madness. Well, me being me, I went through that exhibit the wrong way. And finally, I, I, I went to a place where they explain his work during that time in these pieces. And after I read the explanation, it was the most brilliant part of the museum. When I understood the, the methodology that he was using and what he was conveying, it was brilliant. And a, a realization came to me that day, and that is this. Oftentimes at the surface of our life, we see things happening that this doesn't make sense. 
Maybe you're here today and you're like, this is my least favorite part of my life. I don't know what God is doing in my life. I I don't know if he's doing anything, but whatever he's doing, it's not good. But here's what I want to tell you. One day, you're going to get to the other side. And maybe God won't explain everything, but I really believe this. We can get to that point where we look back and say, God was with me more then than he ever was. God was doing something in my life then that like Jacob, the presence of the Lord is here and I knew it not. God was producing perseverance in my life. God was producing character in my life. God was producing something within me that got me to where I am now. And I tell you that to say this, don't give up. Don't quit today. Why? Because hope comes from faith. Keep believing. Hope comes from suffering. God's doing something in you, not to you. Number three, hope comes from love. God loves you. God knows where you're at. He hasn't forgotten. There is no wasted prayers. There are no wasted prayers trials. Trust him. Does anybody trust him today? Come on, let's lift up our hands all over this place. Father, I pray, God, for every person, God, going through a season of suffering, Lord, I pray, God, be with them today. Lord, I pray they wouldn't quit. God, I pray they would persevere. God, I pray they wouldn't let go of their faith, God. I pray, God, Lord, that you would do something in us, God, that goes beyond what's happening around us. Lord, and I pray, Jesus, that the love of God would fill our hearts, God, through your Holy Spirit today, God. I pray, remind somebody, Lord, how much you love them. Come on, how many's living for that hope of glory today? Come on, let's clap our hands all over this place. We're gonna sing one more song. If you need to come up, touch God, come on. Let's take a few minutes before we leave today. And let's touch Him. Let's sing this. Sing this with faith. I know you're working. I know you're working. I know.
want to show you what character. I want to show you what hope looks like. And I, I'm going to embarrass him, but he'll forgive me later. And brother brother uh, Kent, can you bring your father up here? Hey, man, come on. Let's give him a hand. Let's give Brother Lyle a hand. 